This video provides several examples of unit conversion and dimensional analysis that are relevant to physics. I usually do one or two of these in lecture, but I've provided a few additional ones here, so I've got a fairly complete set for students who haven't had chemistry. Our textbooks assumed you've already learned basic SI units in a chemistry class because almost everyone required to take physics is in a major that requires chemistry in the first semester of college. And since chemistry spends weeks on all sorts of unit conversion problems, including the SI prefixes, there's only a basic review in the first chapter of our physics book. So if you don't already know the basic SI prefixes, you need to learn them on your own from our textbook, other books, office hours, or work with a tutor in the learning commons while doing problems. The other important detail, and the reason I provide this for everybody, is that chemistry classes are taught assuming you cannot do algebra. That's a bit of an oversimplification, but in physics we assume you can do algebra. And as a result, we emphasize substitution as the primary technique when working within the SI system. Here's an example. If I want to convert grams to kilograms, I sub substitute 10 to the third for kilo. So one kilogram is one times 10 to the third grams. And if I want to know the conversion factor, it's that 10 to the minus three kilograms is one gram. By the way, notice, Although it's not really proper SI, it helps to sometimes think of a gram as being a millikilogram. Now a real example, converting area in square centimeters to square meters. The important thing here that's often not learned even after a whole semester of chemistry is that a centimeter is a single word. It's not a product, it's a single word. So you say centimeter squared, that means you're squaring the entire word. If you do a substitution, you replace centimeter with 10 to the minus 2 meters. So if you've got centimeter squared, you've got 10 to the minus 2 meters squared, and therefore 1 centimeter squared is 1 times 10 to the negative 4 square meters. Notice you have to be careful to use algebra to distribute the power of 2. Many students pass chemistry without ever learning this, and the problems show up when they get to physics problems that use areas or volumes. Another example, converting density in grams per cubic centimeter to kilograms per cubic meter. We just substitute a gram is a 10 to the minus 3 kilograms. The centimeter is 10 to the minus 2 meters, but it's cubed. After you distribute the power of 3, you get 10 to the minus 3 divided by 10 to the minus 6, which is 10 to the third. So the gram per cubic centimeter is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Caution. Chemistry teaches this using this thing that people call the railroad track or bar line method, where you just draw a line across the paper and break down each piece. And the thing that a lot of students don't get is that centimeter cubed means centimeter times centimeter times centimeter, the product of those three words. And if you write that out carefully, show all your steps, then you will have three occurrences of 100 centimeters in the numerator, and you'll get the right answer. However, many students guess rather than do each step, step by step by step carefully, looking for a shortcut, and that shortcut usually results in a wrong answer. You can help this with a bit of assessment. There's a few factoids that you should know if you're planning to do engineering or physics or any of the related fields like chemistry. 1,000 kilograms is called a ton, spelled in a sort of French style, T-O-N-N-E. A ton is a metric ton, which is about 2,200 pounds. When you do the conversions, you find that because a liter is exactly a factor of 1,000 cubic centimeters and 1,000th one of a cubic meter, that one gram per cubic centimeter is a kilogram per liter and a ton per cubic meter. That last one, of course, is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. That's really convenient if you want to think from the chemistry lab to the grocery store to the civil engineering operation where you're working with tons of material. They really are a very simple relationship between those very different unit ratios. Another example, kilometers per hour to meters per second. This is again just substitution. A kilometer is 1,000 meters, an hour is 3,600 seconds. So replace each of those and we get that one kilometer per hour is one over 3.6 meters per second. Or a meter per second is 3.6 kilometers per hour. That result, that when you get 1,000 over 3,600, that that is equivalent to dividing by 3.6, is a shortcut that I would allow you to use in class. You should quickly learn that you can convert kilometers per hour to meters per second by dividing by 3.6. But when in doubt, check it by doing each step. Miles per hour to meters per second isn't really, strictly speaking, within SI. 
but it's something that we encounter a lot in everyday type of uh, problems in physics. A mile per hour is, of course, 5,280 feet for a mile divided by 3,600 seconds, but that's not yet in meters. But going through feet per second makes it pretty easy to do because you know that one foot is 12 inches and each inch is 2.54 centimeters. So you just get that factor you see at the end, 12 times 0.0254 to convert a foot to meters. I don't learn any other details. That is, I don't know what that product 12 times 0.0254 is. I know there's 2.54 centimeters in an inch and use that to do this conversion. The result is a mile per hour is 0.447 as you see, and therefore one meter per second is the reciprocal of that. Now on the useful factoid side, the fact that one meter per second is about 2.237 miles per hour is quite useful. And if you want to actually have a decent three to four sig fig value, I recommend updating the number in the front cover of your textbook to be 2.237 instead of the rounded value that they give. This is quite useful if you need to convert miles per hour to meters per second for a problem, but it's also nice to assess answers. And finally, there's also an exact conversion in the uh, foot second unit system, and that 60 miles per hour is exactly 88 feet per second, and therefore an approximately 26.8 meters per second. And I'll just mention in passing, if you ever want to hear the story, knowing that conversion factor to feet per second once got me out of a traffic ticket. Now, there's also problems that are not unit conversion. They're dimensional analysis. In physics and engineering, we usually use dimensional analysis to refer to checking that an equation is not, simply not wrong. But it's also a way to remember an equation, because correct equations must have correct units. So for example, centripetal acceleration is v squared over r, and that is not wrong, because v squared is meters per second times meters per second, divided by meters gives you meters per second squared. So that formula has the right units. And a lot of other things you might guess for that formula would have the wrong units. So this is a way to be sure that what you're using is not wrong. However, it will not tell you about constants. For example, the area of a rectangle is length times width, but the area of a circle is pi r squared. That's got units of square meters, but there's a factor of pi. The surface area of a sphere, of a sphere is four pi r squared also meter squared, but you've got to know the four pi. And similarly, equation we use right away for position function, x is in meters, v times t is clearly in meters, a times t squared is in meters, but meters per second per second times second squared doesn't tell you about that one half. You have to know the equation to get that factor of one half. Dimensional analysis will not tell you that number. The other thing is to realize that chemistry often uses dimensional analysis instead of using equations. Because of the kinds of things you encounter in physics and engineering, this is a habit you need to break if you want to be successful. We do use it in physics and engineering, but only for certain kinds of calculations and only by being very consciously aware that we are doing something that is sort of a cheat by using that linear relation rather than uh, using an equation pretending that we're changing units when we're not really changing units. An example, converting mass to moles. Moles are not mass. Moles are a number of things, not a mass. There actually is an equation where you divide the mass by the gram molecular weight to get the number of moles, but most people don't bother learning that equation or ever using it because it's a simple linear relationship and you can use unit ratios to get it right. So you convert kilograms to grams, and then you convert, sort of scare quoted, grams to moles uh, in this kind of thing that you've seen done in chemistry. And once you see that the kilograms cancel and the grams cancel, you're left with the moles, you know you've done it right. But a more dangerous example involving volume, if you want to convert a density to a mass, in chemistry you'll often just do a simple dimensional analysis argument where you say, ah, kilograms per cubic meter, I need to multiply by that by three meters a meter for length, a meter for width, and a meter for height. And that's fine if you've got a rectangular solid. You can get away with it. But don't do that in physics. You need to break that habit for real because volumes are not just length times width times height. There are lots of other volumes out there. If you have a hollow cylinder, the formula for that is pi times the quantity r2 squared minus r1 squared, close parent times the height, 
where R2 is the outside radius and R1 is the inside radius. If you want to get anything that resembles a correct answer, you've got to start with the equation for the volume of a hollow cylinder, period, end of story. If you guess it needs to be R1 times R2 times H, because each of those things are in meters, you're going to get a ridiculously wrong answer. You must start with an equation, rho times V, where rho is the density, and volume is whatever the volume needs to be, where you use your brain, algebra, and geometry to get the right result. Okay, so now if any of this is new to you, if any of it is new to you, pay particular attention to units in class in your homework and ask questions when it, questions show up. Also realize the tutors in Learning Commons deal with this all the time for chemistry so they can help you a lot with this particular subject. You don't need a physics tutor to uh, help you with this kind of topic. I don't have you do messy uh, conversions, but you will have to do this on some problems in my class and definitely on engineering exams.